Hello everyone, welcome to Chasing the Murderer, and today we are on part 74 of Life Beyond the Grave. This is attached to one of the most evil, this is attached to one of the most sad stories I've ever covered, and it's hard to believe what in the world happened in this case. We're in 2018, the timeline we call the recipe of disaster. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met and they have hit it off like they've known each other forever. One of uh, the main witnesses of Lori's change here is Zach Cox. This is Lori's nephew, the son of Adam Cox. I may hop back and forth a little bit through this uh, couple, next couple of months. So it's around November and there's a preparing a people conference in Lori's area. And Lori has set up with her friend Melanie Gibb to bring in a crap load of people to come stay at Lori's house. There, they're going to hold a fireside and attend the conference. According to Zach, Lori tells him that she will be doing or taping a podcast with Melanie Gibb and others like Chad Bedebel, Thor, Jason Mao, and that they have to be quiet. And Zach says he and the kids stay upstairs while they do that. And while they are preparing for this big event, well, Chad Daybell has started a love novel for he and his lover, Lori Vallow. Remember Serena? We had talked about her a little bit earlier. Well, she's been invited to come hang out at Lori's house for this conference. And Serena says she's a very powerful supporter of Jesus Christ and the doctrines attached to him. So this means she's very into, you know, the Book of Mormon and the Bible as well. And she believes most everything that she has read in those books. This includes the miracle angels devils, demons, and Satan. She says she too has had deep spiritual experiences like many people in this story. She also deals with deja vu, a sign that there are something else going on with her life. According to Serena, she says she's always looking for open-minded individuals, also individuals that are open to new ideas. And this is something she's going to learn real quick. So according to Zach, he says he comes home one day and he sees 30 to 40 cars out front of his Aunt Lori's home. Serena said in an interview that she does go to Lori's house and stay with this group of people, but they're all new faces to her. She is not aware of Lori or Chad or any of them. And before the conference, they have this fireside meeting. According to Serena, it is Friday morning. That's around November 16th of 2018. Skipping a little bit here, she says, By Sunday morning, Lori is pulling people to the side like Serena and talking to them about these new ideas and teachings that she's come up with. That is not the LDS doctrine. Something you need to understand is Lori Vallow, she's a very impatient type person. She was ready to start this group of people, trust me, and she thought she would be part of this 144,000, if you remember. And Lori had already spoken to Moroni, the angel that spoke to Joseph Smith, before she met any of these people. And she believed that she was a prophet. We learned that Lori was very interested in multiple probations, meaning multiple lives. And under just a month, there's no way that Lori would have had the time to learn everything that she knew from Chad Daybell. It was said that Lori was already dabbling a bit in multiple probations by listening to podcasts by people like Julie Rowe and others. And it seems that Lori really it truly believes that she had a big role to play when it comes to multiple probations. Very key to this case, Lori is persistent. She's bossy. She's a leadership type. She's determined and she sets goals. I've learned she wants something to happen. She does what she needs to get it done. And according to the research that I've done up until this point, it does show that Lori has some kind of problem mentally, and she's had this problem her entire life. She's never really faced or dealt with it. She also carries some personality traits that also match her actions during this time. 
And I truly believe that because she didn't do what she needed to do to understand her demons, it would lead her to take part in one of the most disastrous stories ever. People have speculated that Lori was basically a psychopath or a sociopath, schizophrenic. And we could find many traits that would suggest there's a possibility these could be some of her problems. She's never been professionally diagnosed, at least until recently. And we don't know what that diagnosis is. And it seems to me that during this time, she was pulling Chad in, just like she was pulling in Melanie Gibb and Serena and Zalima and Alex Cox. And when she talks to Serena about these multiple probations, Serena says she had deja vu in her life. This helped her believe that what Lori was teaching her could be true. She began trusting things that Lori was teaching her. She says she realized she had just met Lori, so she had a little bit of hesitancy, but she believed her. And Lori wasn't shy. Lori feels as if she has the authority to ask these people personal questions as she's recruiting for this group of people about their spiritual experiences, their ordinances, as if she's given them a test to see if they're good enough to fit into this group that she's creating. After that, Lori builds these people up, makes them feel special. And that's important to do for a leader, isn't it? What's interesting is Serena says in an interview with police later on that she doesn't hear Chad talk about any of this stuff during this weekend that the Preparing the People conference is going. So this is early on. Lori was not hitting everybody up that attended her fireside or stayed with her at her house. She actually was searching for a certain type of people or certain people and pulling those certain people to the side. Serena admitted that she believed that her spiritual experience didn't so much go with everyone else's. She believed in some things that a lot of people do not. And looking back, she believes during this time, Lori was taking those, I guess you can say, weakness, weaknesses or trust or her beliefs and manipulating Serena. Here's a bit of a clip where she, Serena did an interview with police later. Anything unusual, but I wasn't expecting anything unusual too. I mean, everybody there was brand new to me, so I didn't see anything unusual. What was, what was the... Uh... Was the conference at the house, or what did they talk about? It? No, so there was a fireside at the house, like a morning meeting type thing for people to come to, and I think that was on a Friday morning. Um, but the conference itself was at the facility. I'm so sorry. Like no, I came from Connecticut, I was com I didn't know where I was. <laughs> I just got a ride to different places, and I had never been here before, no, you're like fine. as an adult. So I was pretty overwhelmed with meeting everybody, and I didn't like I just trusted we were at the conference, yeah. <laughs> wherever the conference was held. That's where it was for the conference. Yeah, there's and it's long time, so I don't expect yeah, you know, yeah, all that stuff. How long? Um, how long were Lori and Chad kind of teaching the teachings that they were going on and for the conference? Was there anything different that they were teaching that wasn't in the LDS phase? Yes, definitely. So Lori and Chad didn't say anything to me until Sunday morning. Lori kind of pulled me aside and started saying a few things that were not like according to the LDS phase. That were outside kind of that purview. Did she ever talk about um, zombies or not at that time or anything like that? That came later. Okay. Um, but she like that morning is when she talked about like multiple probations and like coming to the earth multiple times and how did you feel about that? How did I personally feel about that? Um kind of mixed. So part of me was wanted to believe it. Part of me has has had like deja vu experiences and I've had like 
I've had deja vu. And so for, for me, it kind of explained those kind of moments in my life. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's true. I kind of believe it. I did. I believed it. Mixed too, though, because I didn't know I had just met Lori. So, you know, a little bit of hesitancy, but I did believe her. So you can see, you know, she felt manipulated because she believed her because she felt that she was open-minded and would like to give people the benefit of the doubt who all is here with them. Well, you have Chad Daybell, you have many of Lori Vallow's family members, including her mother, her, her um, niece. Zach is usually there in between school and he takes JJ to the movies or whatever during this time when Lori feels she needs the kids to get out of her hair. Zach said it's somewhere in this time frame where he walks into the house or either walks downstairs. I can't remember. It's in an interview and I was going to put a clip, but I don't have time. Um, and he sees all these people and they were talking and they stop suddenly what they're doing and everyone just stares at him awkwardly. He must have felt creeped out by this. I think I would, too. As, I mean, you hear these people talking and you walk in and then all of a sudden they stop and stare at you. For Lori, this must have been frustrating because she was trying her best to keep the kids out of the picture. That was important to her. I believe this is partial or part of the motive as to why they go missing. Lori is very good at gathering everyone she can, people that she knows, and getting people she knows to gather people as well. For those of you that's never been in a beauty pageant, she has. In order to win or to get ahead, you have to be the person that's able to collect enough personal people support as well as financial support, meaning ads or companies that support you. So this is something Lori understands and is well aware of. So what is this conference for preparing a people about? Well, it's the power of personal revelation. This event is from 16th through the 17th in Mesa, Arizona. It's a special event bringing to light hidden things, the power of personal re revelation. And the speakers include quite a few people. We're not going to go through them all. Let's go through some familiar names. Mike Straw. This is going to be one of his last ones. Mike Simpson, Jason Mao, Bruce Porter, Hector Salsa Jr., Sean Littlebear, Russ Barlow, Thor, Ray Elder, Chad Daybell, and the people that are surrounding Lori Well. They are definitely there in support of these teachings. They know exactly why they're there. And Zalima says this is about the time that she's pulled in to these lies and manipulation by Lori and Chad. According to one witness, Chad and Lori get quite affectionate on one of their morning walks during this Preparing a People conference weekend. That's quick moving. And they're very interested, a lot of these people, in how they're taught that they can come to Earth and different bodies of different people and different lifestyles. It's during the conference that Serena says that she actually meets Chad Daybell and she goes up to him to talk to him and ask him questions. She says that she had never met anybody like Chad before. She asked Chad what, she, what he sees happening with New England and she was asking him very specific questions because she heard that Chad had the ability to tell the future. And she tells us to investigators later that she was very curious to see what Chad thinks about several ideas, but she never goes into, you know, details or specifics on it. Lori's brother, Alex Cock, has, has been invited. He's a big supporter of Lori and Chad Daybell's books. Salima says the first night that she meets Alex Cox, he's kind of flirtatious, he's funny. It's around this time that several of these people claim that Chad is having visions and giving them blessings. Zalima says during one of these blessings with Chad, she sees a vision of the Phoenix area being overrun with vegetation. And the only thing that she sees really intact is a white building resembling a temple. 
Chad and Lori are meeting with these people off and on, and when they get a chance to speak with them, like at these events, they kind of introduce things like translation. What exactly is translation? Well, there's three steps to translation. There's uh, physical, spiritual, and emotional. Interestingly, Chad claims or tells them that he's able to keep score and keep tabs on the process of those in translation. So here's a little bit more information on Zach's experience when he walks into the house. He says he walks to the house and the front door is open. Once he gets inside, he can hear one person talking. Then one head turns to look at him and then the rest turn around and look at him. They all just stare at him and completely stop talking. Zach said he could feel his heart drop and it was the scariest thing he ever witnessed. He said it freaked him out and he felt like he was in a horror movie. He says it's from that moment on that he notices that his relationship between him and his Aunt Lori change. Guys, I wish I had time to go into the Universal model that they're also supporting in this. And this is where they're trying to um, use science to support some of the things that they believe in. So make sure you have time to check that out. What did Melanie Gibb have to say? Well, she's saying not long after they met, Chad was in Arizona for another event and that he and Gibb were invited by Lori to stay at her home. And Gibb described that their conversations definitely were different and often very personal, meaning they were talking about things you wouldn't normally talk about at church. Melly Gibb also described Lori as enjoying listening to past lives and podcasts. And how is Lori pulling all these better uh, people together while well, she feels like she has this growing power to lead these other people to new teachings attached to past lives and lure them in with flattery and by making people feel special. She's sharing some of her thoughts with her family members and the family members say that they're, you know, at the time they were just trying to be very, very supportive of Lori and her spiritual um, evolution. And here's the thing, for those who support Lori, well, she will give them her love and blessings, her friendship. But for those who do not, they will be shunned by her, and she will demand others that are close to her to shun them too. And as I mentioned before, her children are being cast aside more each, de each day. And her nephew, Zach, is becoming concerned about, you know, the people in Lori's lives and the thought process. We are approaching January and this is when things are going to really start to spiral out of control. Around November 20th of 2018, there is a podcast uh, featuring Mike Strahd. The title is Access and Fullness of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. So Mike Strahd, who was considered not to be seeking celebrityism or... Um, having trouble talking, aren't I? Um, or seeking fame from these teachings. Well, he's kind of doing that now. And Lori is very interested in all these podcasts. Now she's taking part in some of these podcasts while her kids are sitting on the back burner. Lori's very interested in well, as well as people with near-death experiences. Uh, people who claim to have special gifts from God himself. So these visionaries who speak with spirits, angels, are preparing for end days. And remember, she's not getting much sleep because these entities, these creatures, these spirits or angels, they're waking her up and giving her to-do lists. They're having conversations with her. So she seems to be kind of getting exhausted, but she's also seeking to hear more from these voices. A lot of us believe that uh, Lori is so infatuated with Chad for reasons that she thinks that maybe it might help her become more of an example to God and to those looking for salvation and signs. Signs at the end days and the signs of gathering. And Chad, who seems to like to use these powers or powers of a publisher 
to spend time with people and oftentimes help them write his ideas along with theirs. Around this time as well, Chad and Lori, well, they're kind of turning against Julie Rowe. In fact, Julie Rowe is turning dark. And it is speculated, and I'm pretty certain, that uh, Lori and Chad, they go to their church ward leaders and bishops and, you know, say things against Julie. They want to get her excommunicated from the church. This isn't exactly happening at this moment, but it's about to start happening without the next within the next few months, and I wanted to mention that in case I forget. Around this time, Lori is sending books to her brother, Adam Cox, about near-death experiences, books like Chad Daybell. Adam says, really, Mormons, they do not believe in anything Lori's pushing in 2018. Lori asks her brother, you know, are you going to read the book? And Adam says, no, I'm not interested in those kinds of things. So some people have, well, this was, I think was originally sent to Justin Lum, this rumor was, where they talked about Jason Mao married Chad and Lori at the temple, or that a spiritual angel named by, by the name Moroni in November 2018 after meeting at a prayer and a people event. Jason Mao was at this event. At some point, Chad starts to compare his life at home without Lori to Harry Potter and how that, you know, he's trapped living under the stairs by the Dudleys. Interesting. Now, Chad seems to believe in the magic inside the Harry Potter books. He, uh, we got to remember the author said, you know, she did put in real spells. Um, I don't have the text where he kind of writes this, but hopefully I'll be able to find that and get it out here soon for you guys to read. Remember, Chad is a big support system for translated beings. To understand how these people view Satan, well, it'd be people like Melanie Gibb, Lori Bellow, and Julie Rowe, you have to know some of these verses. Verses like Job 1.6. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? To which he responded, from roaming through the earth. He is physically positioned in the universe. Job 1 through 2, he fails to know the future and is, his potency is shown to be limited by God. Matthew 4, Satan legitimately offer, offers Jesus the kingdoms of the world. These kingdoms seem to have geographical and governmental nature. Satan himself can manipulate matter, weather systems, and bacterial life. Job 2, 8. He infects Job with a skin disease. His purpose is to inflict Job. And so Satan's able to do things or change things, feats that are not afforded to humans. Satan can also influence and sway legal proceedings and government structures. For example, in Revelations 2.10, Jesus states that Satan is in the process of influence, influencing one's legal proceedings by throwing a collection of Christians into prison. Also, Satan aggressively seeks to trap individual Christians. 1 Timothy 3.7 says that he seeks to trap elders. His minions study individuals and seek to tempt and twist them in accordance to um, certain patterns of sin. Satan is more skilled at deception than any other created being. John 8, 44 says his nature is to lie. If his mouth is moving, he is lying. Satan is able to kill Christians. He is able to kill you physically, Job 1 through 2. At one point, Job asked God if he can kill Job. But God denies him this opportunity. So guys, I'm having trouble with my mic if you can't tell. Sorry about that. So right now, I'm going to share some of what Chad Daybell speaks about at some of these conferences. Before we, uh, I let this play, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and you can give to my Patreon at Chasing a Murder. Um, also, do not forget about these beautiful faces. They're still missing. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you guys soon. I have a message from 
prepared for when you get back to your ward tomorrow or something when they say, well, what did you hear? What, what did they tell you? And so I'm going to give a statement that you can share with them again. And so what I see is from Brigham City to Santa Quinn, it's like a special plate of land that will never be destroyed. Nothing will ever bad, nothing bad will ever happen in that stretch of land. And that the people will prosper until the second coming without any trouble. So, as you know, I've, I've had a couple near-death experiences, and I'll talk about that. And it seems like I've been waiting for 20 years for something to happen. I write all these novels, and people are like, when's it going to start, you know? And, but doesn't it really feel like in the last two to three weeks, the eclipse is likely a sign, a sign of warning of what's coming. Uh, this is the Houston Temple. I, I've looked at other photos, and that, you know, that's, that's probably 20 feet deep from the front fountain, and just how that temple was filled with water. Um, North Korea, they're going a little nuts right now. They, uh, Kim Jong-un seems to be intent on causing havoc in the world. Uh, no, uh, no question about it with him. Uh, even as we speak, Hurricane Irma is on its way to Florida. Um, uh, the earthquake in Mexico, I didn't get on here because it just happened. But the fires in California and Montana, it just feels like uh, times are starting to begin. Um, here's one of my new favorite characters because this is how people think I act. Uh, there's Woody Harrelson in the movie 2012. And that's how my relatives honestly think that's how I've acted the last five years. <laughs> But he was right. <laughs> no. But in reality, uh, I loved this picture that was in the on the Deseret News site of President Uchtdorf down in Houston and the great uh, love and happiness. He kept a smile on his face. And that's the message I really want to share is that we can prepare ourselves to survive through these trials that are coming. And that's the whole reason you're here. I know that the Spirit has guided you and prompted you that you have a role to play.